at what infrared frequency did you find peaks that indicated that it was hydrocarbons? Did you find um, something that indicated there was a carbon to oxygen bond or uh, what specifically? At what infrared frequency did you find peaks that indicated that it was hydrocarbons? Did you find um, something that indicated there was a carbon to oxygen bond or uh, what specifically? Okay, I, so I'm not, I'm I'm at home right now, <laughs> so I don't have the uh, spectrograph in front of me, but um, so I can't tell you the the numbers of the peaks, but I can tell you that some of the peaks that lined up virtually perfectly were uh, a methyl group, so CH3 groups, uh, CO groups, uh, uh, sorry, C double O groups, so carbonyl groups, carboxylic acid groups, and um, carbon-carbon double bonds, those, those were the ones that were perfectly aligned as far as... Um, and those are, those are hydrocarbons, and those are things that we call organic, so that makes sense. Right, and so I, if I could just, since you asked that, I, could, I mentioned that I would like to just ask, answer the question that came right yeah, before we ahead. went to okay, the doctor. Yeah, about why I'm referring to it as an organic compound. I, I don't mean organic in the sense of like organic foods, but from a chemistry perspective, organic means that there are carbons and hydrogens. Oh, okay. I got right, you. Right. And so carbon dioxide would be a good example of a inorganic or non-organic compound because while it does have carbon, so it's all framed around carbon. Uh, there are carbons and oxygens, but there's no hydrogens. Uh, sort of by definition, or an organic compound is one that has carbons and hydrogens present. So the fact that it definitely has CH3, uh, carbon with three hydrogens bonded to it, it's an organic compound from a chemistry perspective. Okay, that, that's a great answer. Uh, attempts to use fixatives for EM analysis have been ongoing for months. What did you mean by that? Well, <laughs> it, it turns out... I'm a molecular biologist. Normally I'm dealing with DNA and RNA, but, uh, you know, since I've gotten into this Morgellons research, my t lab technician and I have had to sort of branch out into areas that we really aren't experts in. Well, uh, one of the professors at the OSU Medical School is a, a histologist. He looks at uh, uh, tissue samples, uh, sort of like a pathologist, but at the cellular level, and um, they do electron microscopy. Well, I wasn't even aware of it, but before doing the electron microscopy, the, the samples have to be what's called, what are called fixed, that is put into a fixative. Well, these Morgellon fibers are really tiny. So if you're trying to picture the size I'm talking about, picture like an eyebrow maybe, a single eyebrow hair or an eyelash from a really young child. You know, if you if you had it in tweezers and you held up to the light and your eyes are good, you can see it, but barely. Well, to try and figure out how to immerse that sample into uh, the fixative for five hours and then do multiple uh, ethanol, alcohol washes, and affix it to the slide so that the electron microscopy can be done, well, it also has to be dried uh, before the electron microscopy, well, we've just had all sorts of problems with trying to get such tiny samples um, just prepped so that the experiments could be done. The, we've, we're all lined up to do it. We have time on the electron micros, microscope set up. But um, basically, you know, the first half dozen tries, we, we kept either losing the samples, that is to say they were coming off the slides, they were coming out of the little uh, tea bag. Um, uh, uh, devices that we had to try and uh, hold the fibers in place. So it's just been a kind of a pain trying to, to, to work out the details of how to even do the experiment. <laughs> so you're saying even air movement could blow it off of a slide or a sneeze or something like that? Or yeah, exactly. Any, any small movement of air could disrupt or, or blow those things around, right? Right. So what we're, See, normally... You know, while it's true, normally they're looking at individual cells, which are way smaller, but what they normally do is take a, a fairly large piece of tissue. I mean, we're talking like a centimeter by a centimeter cubed. So, I mean, it's, it's something you have no trouble seeing with the naked eye. And what they do is they, they fix that, and then they will shave it down or embed it in paraffin. There are lots of different ways they can do it. 
but the point is they're, they're starting with a very large sample that then they manipulate down. And so, uh, or even if it was a bacterial smear, you know, you see all these cool electron micrographs of uh, uh, bacteria and what they look like, or even viruses, like the H1N1 that's, uh, you know, big in the media right at the moment. But you're starting with hundreds to thousands of copies of that individual virus or bacterium that are on a slide. Well, and so then they just pick and choose till they find the best one. Well, we're trying to work with something that's really tiny, but only one at a time, and so that's the problem. I see. Yeah, I bet that's real challenging. Oh, it, it's, uh, I mean, this was something that in my mind, you know, I was thinking, well, a couple days to work out the details. Well, it's kind of uh, dragged out into a couple months now, <laughs> trying to get it where we can uh, fix it. Because it has to be, the, the sample size needs to be basically a millimeter long. Okay, doctor, how about the ingestion? Uh, are these ingested through air uh, that we breathe? Is that the way we get the fibers or whatever this material is into our bodies? Well, I mean, that's one of the big questions we're trying to figure out. And actually, once, I mean, my hope is that once we actually know that the true chemical composition, so not just whether there's carbons and oxygens and nitrogens, but how they're assembled, uh, as well as elemental analysis. So, for instance, are there metals in, present in these? Um, wh- how exactly are they made up? That might help guide us not only for a treatment, but also where are they coming from. Right now, what can we say? Well, what are the possibilities? They could be swallowed or ingested through food or, or liquid. They could be breathed in through uh, the lungs. There could be a microorganism that is manufacturing or secreting this unusual material. Could it even be, it is not my idea, but some people with Morgellons have proposed that for whatever reason they think that their cells are actually somehow synthesizing or manufacturing this. Well, the bottom line is I don't know. Well, you know, Dr. My, my inclination after hearing some of the analysis here and the difficulty in uh, in reaching an analysis of this material is that uh, high tech uh, comes to my mind immediately, and perhaps nanotechnology of some kind, to create uh, materials that we're having a hard time analyzing as to their elemental and compound type of structure would indicate to me that some high tech, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, techniques were used to create these uh, these uh, fibers. What do you think? Well, keep in mind, I mean, first of all, the problems in analysis are twofold. One, this is something that is not in any of the databases. Okay, that's a given. Uh, Some people have said, well, maybe the Tulsa Police Department doesn't have the most sophisticated database or what. Well, that's, you know, if you're a forensics lab technician doing spectroscopy, it doesn't matter whether you're in Tulsa or Chicago, you're using pretty much similar databases. So that that's not a, a factor. They're unknown in the sense that they aren't in the database. So whatever they are made of hasn't been assembled previously and then tested and in a database. Now, it's not that it came up as a total blank. It's just that the peaks and valleys of the, the spectroscopic printout didn't match anything. So in other words, it's not nylon or rayon or polyester or cotton or any of the known sorts of things. So that's, that's the first piece of the, the puzzle. Now, the problems we're having in my lab aren't so much getting the analysis done, it's simply getting the sample prepared for the analysis. I'm very confident that once once we do that, we will find out, is there silver, is, you know, is there nickel, is there uh, beryllium, what, what exactly are the elements that make up these fibers, 